56. Number 56, when we all get to heaven, number 56. <clears throat> Stand on the last verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow of a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us sing, be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory, well, the toes of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Everyone see it. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be home. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing. And shut the victory. Oh, you're a good voice today. It's good to see everyone here. Thank you so much for being here at Blessed Old Baptist Church this morning. I don't say this every Sunday, but back on the back information desk, uh, if you go to the far left side of it, there's a little container that have forms that say prayer request. And if there is something that you'd like to have the church pray about, if you'll fill out that request and just hand it back to one of our ushers, in the uh, foyer area, they'll see to it that it gets to the pulpit and that we read that. That way we get these prayer requests in front of the church and get folks praying, which always is a good thing, always is a good thing. And so I want to uh, bring these requests to you this morning before we have prayer. Please pray for Mark Reagan. Uh, he's in surgery right now. 
is a, is a relative of uh, the Gordons in surgery right now, having a double lung transplant. Mark Reagan, very, of course, serious, serious uh, surgery. Please pray for Jean Mowry. She's not feeling well today. Then Henry Keene, please pray for uh, him. One of our bus families, he's in Bloomington Hospital, Henry Keene. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to pray one for another. And Lord, we do want to lift these uh, folks up. I pray, Lord, for uh, for Mark right now. He's in surgery. Lord, be with the doctors. Be with uh, those that assist them. Lord, be with uh, everyone that has a hand in this. Lord, give them unusual skill, Lord, and just please Keep Mark in your good hands. Keep him safe, Lord. Help help us to get a good report about this. We also pray for Sister Jean and ask, Lord, that you'd help her to feel better, strengthen her body. And then Henry, Lord, we want to pray for him also. And ask, Lord, please, your uh, blessing in his life, healing, and to get him home from the hospital as quick as possible. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, thank you for the beautiful sunshine that greeted us as we came to church this morning. And Lord, for watching over us through another week. Lord, uh, as junior church is going on and primary church is going on, children are being ministered to. Pray, Lord, you'd bless those that uh, just pour their hearts into the children's programs here. And Lord, as we meet here in the auditorium, please meet with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's a delight, just a wonderful delight to have everyone here. It's always a blessing when we have first-time visitors. We, we prepare for your coming. We have a visitor's packet. And then there's a uh, card, a visitor's card on the outside of that. We'd like you to fill out and drop in the offering plate and uh, everything else keep, okay? But if you're visiting here and you've not come before, you've never received a visitor's packet, would you raise your hand good and high and we'll come right to you and give you a visitor's packet. Anybody else, anybody first time? As I see some returning visitors and it's a blessing to have you. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of our service. Uh, today. Just a few announcements, folks. I'm telling you, November's been an exciting month. Can you believe it's halfway over? Now, brace yourself because you're going to see something in the bulletin. You're going to see the Christmas word in the bulletin. And we put it off as long as possible. But because of our Christmas, church Christmas banquet always coming on the first Saturday in December, we needed to get it in there. But let's talk about today, first of all, five o'clock tonight, choir practice. I don't know if you noticed. But our choir is growing. It was nice to see the stage almost filled up. And we've had several folks that uh, join uh, as we started back up this year. And the choir's doing great. Five o'clock and then six o'clock evening service. Wednesday night, we have our children's Bible club as well as our midweek service. Uh, and uh, 6.50 and 7 o'clock. After the service tonight, my wife celebrated a birthday. A birthday. And, you know, you can't tell how old your wife is. You know, it's just one of the rules. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, but pray for her because next year she's going to be 60. Okay, so I, I can't tell you what what she is now, but just be sure and pray for her. And because uh, I've never been married to a 60-year-old before, so pray for me also. I've got a, a year to kind of wrap my brain around that. And so, anyway, I'm going to keep talking and just dig myself into such a deep hole. But uh, anyway, uh, Creation Fair this Friday night, November 20th. And then uh, we also have a birthday card table for two of our staff members, Brother Chad Gordon, Brother Roger Young, next Sunday. We'll say more about those things. And I mentioned the Christmas banquet. Oh, you're going to want to come. Uh, Saturday, December 5th, 5 o'clock to 7.30, right out there in our fellowship hall. I don't care if you've been coming for 20 years or you've You've only come a couple of times. You you don't want to miss this. You'll love it. You'll enjoy it. It's just a wonderful church family night. And uh, so we have that. Now we have Wes Gasaway, missionary to Egypt. He'll be coming uh, and being our guest this Wednesday night. Boy, you want to hear him also. Children's Choir this evening. Children's Choir this evening. Please be here at 540, dressed to sing Children's Choir. I'm looking forward to that. 147. Number, I'm sorry, 247. 247. Saved. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to. 
how he lifted me and what his grace can do for you. Saved by his power divine, saved a new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. He saves me from every sin and harm, secures my soul each day. I'm leaning strong on his mind. I know he'll guide me all the way, saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime, life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. When poor the end all along in long he said to me come on to me and I'll lead you home to live with me eternally saved by his power divine Saved to new life of life, life now is sweet and my joy is complete. For I'm saved, saved, saved. Amen. One hundred forty-six. One one forty-six. The Lord's our rock. In him we hide a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever he'll be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. For oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. For oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears are on, no foes are fly, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us be. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock. In a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge near, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper, ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. And Brother Brian, would you leave some prayer, please? Lord God, I just want to come for you again humbly, recognizing that, uh, God, we don't deserve to even be able to uh, come before you, yet you still want us to worship. Mm. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the freedom to do so today, God. And uh, God, we're want to uh, be blessed in these services, Lord, but we want you to be glorified. Mm -hmm. God, uh, we pray for this offering. We pray that you use it and that it be used to increase your glory, Lord. 
God, if there's anybody in this church house today who just doesn't know for sure even maybe what salvation is, we pray that today they get to sell. God, we want to see a lost sinner come to you. Mm. God, we ask for your uh, spirit to be here in the services, God. And uh, we're going to praise you and all in Jesus' name. Amen. I travel through this land I've been mighty blessed by God I'm holding to his hand Now my journey's almost over And the battle's nearly won I have a feeling in my heart The best is yet to come Oh, the best is yet to come When I walk through heaven's gate For the first time I'll see Jesus I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and say this is your home. I have a feeling in my heart the best is yet to come. I'm standing now on Jordan's banks as I face the rolling tide. The storms of life are raging, but I'm happy down inside. I see the lifeboat coming to take me safely home. And I have a feeling in my heart the best is yet to come. Oh, the best is yet to come when I walk through heaven's gate. For the first time I'll see Jesus, I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and say this is your home. I have a feeling in my heart the best is yet to come. Oh, the best is yet to come when I walk through heaven's gate. For the first time I'll see Jesus, I can hardly wait. He'll show me to my mansion and say this is your home. I have a feeling in my heart the best is yet to come. I have a feeling in my heart the best is yet to come. Thank you so much. Miss Tanya, is she in here? Would you raise your hand? That lady right there, if you would like to purchase a poinsettia, and um, we do this every year and have our folks uh, sponsor a poinsettia, it's $10, and you can put on the card in memory of a loved one. 
Uh, we uh, uh, do that every year. She needs to know that today. So if you'll see her after the service or the latest tonight after the service, and I'll be reminded to say that again. Well, last Wednesday, uh, I'll mention again tonight, last Wednesday was Veterans Day, and I sat down and I, I uh, had spent some time praying for our country that day, and then I sat down at my desk and I was just really, you have those moments where you're kind of just overwhelmed. You know, I'm a student of American history, and folks, you're either going to study history or you're, you're doomed to repeat history. And a lot of the things that we're throwing away right now is because people have not been taught true American history. One of the things that you'll know and understand when you're studying American history is that there's a lot of folks that paid a big price so that we can sit here and enjoy the freedoms we enjoy today. And those folks ought to be recognized and they shouldn't be forgotten. And so I sat down at my desk and I typed out a appreciation letter for our veterans and uh, put it in an envelope along with a little gift uh, that, that will show uh, our church's appreciation. Do you I'd like to get all our veterans to stand and if you'll remain standing, even after you receive the letter. So if you served in any branch of the armed forces, would you stand at this time? And then after you receive the gift, I'm going to have you remain standing because I'd like you to introduce yourself. Not everybody in here would know who you are. And then also tell what branch of the military you served in and the years uh, of service. But first, I want to give these men an opportunity uninterrupted to shake these a veteran's hands and look them in the eye and say, thank you for your service. And it certainly comes from our heart, heart of your pastor and the heart of good people here at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. All right, we'll start on this side. My name is Jack Gordon. I served in the Army from March of 68 to December 7th. Thank you for your service. Yes, sir. My name is Ron Lewis. I served in the United States Navy December 1973 Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir, for your service. Yes. Mm -hmm. Harry Diving, Army, 1957 and 1964. Thank you, Brother Dive Lee. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Thank you, Brother Tim, for your service. Brother Steve. All right. Thank you very much for your service. Yes, sir. Brother Mark. All right, very good. All right, once I've recognized you, you can be seated. All right, Brother Dave. All right, very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your service. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much for your service. All right. Yes, Brother Jar. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Let's give all of these veterans a round of applause. Amen. Good. All right. Appreciate it. There's a gift card in there along with the letter and, and uh, go uh, shopping on us and uh, enjoy that gift. And I hope when you're doing that, you really understand how much we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Matthew chapter number six, we'll go into our Bibles for the message this morning. Matthew chapter six, we're continuing our series on heaven. Today, I want to preach on treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter six, we'll look at verse 19 and we'll read down through verse 21. We'll look at more of the chapters. We get into the message, but let's read verse 19, 20, and 21 uh, uh, to get us started. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. Let's all stand for the reading of the Bible. Matthew 6 and verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Now, if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, uh, you'll know that these are Jesus' words. Jesus himself is speaking. Now, all of the Bible is God's word. I don't ever want to well, get the, uh, put a notion in somebody's head that because some of it's in red and some of it's black, that 
Some of it's more important than the other. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But I will tell you this, the Lord Jesus Christ means everything to me. When he speaks, I will tell you that I tend to listen, I perk up. So this isn't my advice. This isn't stopping some random man on the street. This is the son of God who came down from heaven. So heaven's not a mystery to him. And he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on an old rugged cross, was buried and three days later rose again, provided salvation for all mankind. Now, if anyone's qualified to tell us how we should or should not live our lives, okay, then Jesus is qualified. All right, I'm a little, I'm a little tired of this generation that keeps stomping their foot, looking at everybody and saying, you're not my boss. Okay, let me tell you something. You better listen to people that know better than you, okay? And especially, you better listen to Jesus, okay? Because he's earned the right to be listened to, okay? So let me start again. <laughs> Jesus says to Jerry Ross, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but... Lay it for yourselves, here it is, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, one of the great truths of the Bible, folks, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Heavenly Father, Lord, open the scriptures to us, open our understanding. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into me. So, Lord, we're going to lift up Jesus. We're going to look at his words, listen to his words. Lord, I pray, dear God, that we would uh, do so with open hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. I thought I'd speak, uh, preach maybe five, six, seven messages on heaven, and I can't seem to turn it off. We, we preached on the three heavens, and then uh, we preached on the light of heaven. The third message, thrones in heaven, then worship in heaven, our bodies in heaven, the alternative to heaven, the cloud of witnesses in heaven, crowns in heaven. I preached a message entitled, Your Invitation to Heaven. We preached on the door of heaven. Then last week, family reunions in heaven, family reunions in heaven. Now today, I want to preach on the subject of treasures in heaven, treasures in heaven. Now in my message on crowns in heaven, I outlined for our congregation that there are five crowns that a Christian can earn at the judgment seat of Christ. I won't reteach all of that, but they are the crown of righteousness given to those who love the Lord's appearing, an incorruptible crown given to those who exhibit self-discipline and temperance in the running of their race, a crown of life given to those who endure patiently and faithfully through trials and testings, a crown of rejoicing, known as the soul winner's crown, given to those who faithfully spread the gospel. And a crown of glory, also known as the shepherd's crown, given to faithful pastors and to those who support them. Now, when I preached that message, I said this. I said, even though there's five crowns that we can earn, there's other rewards that will be given to Christians on Judgment Day. Besides the crowns that we can earn, uh, there are other rewards there's treasures that we can send ahead to be enjoyed for all eternity. Yes, the Bible uses this phrase, treasures in heaven. Yes, some Christians have, I'm going to say it. Yes, some Christians have rewards that await them that other Christians will not receive. Yes, some Christians will have treasures that await them that other Christians will not enjoy. Now, I want to just say this. That might be hard for some of you that's bought into the participation trophy philosophy of life. Come on now. For you parents that think your lazy child should receive the same recognition as a diligent child, this sermon might seem unfair to you. But God's not worried about your def definition of fair. He puts down his own definition of fair. Come on, this is good for your parents. You parents that spend your life accepting excuses for your children and making excuses for your children, this sermon might not seem fair to you. You see, folks, excuses are not going to be awarded, rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Laziness is not going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Selfishness is not going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. 
good intentions. Well, I was always going to get around to it, Lord, will not be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Carnality will not be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. But here's the good news. God will justly reward those who sacrifice for the kingdom of God. God will justly reward those who labor for the kingdom of God. God will justly reward those who fight for the kingdom of God. God will justly reward those who invest in the kingdom of God. And I want to stop right here and make sure that I'm not being misunderstood. I'm not talking at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not talking about whether or not God is trying to figure out whether or not you're going to go to heaven or go to hell. At the judgment seat of Christ, that first judgment seat, everyone that stands there will be born again Christians. You see, folks, it's not decided after death whether or not you're going to go to heaven or not. It's decided before you die whether or not you're going to go to heaven or not. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, to them that also believe in his name. And so, you know what? We have to receive Christ as our Savior. If you receive Christ while you're here on earth, you know what? You don't earn heaven. The, the eternal life is called the gift of God. It was purchased and paid before by the Lord Jesus Christ, freely offered to any man who are, or woman or child who recognize themselves as a, as a sinner and unworthy and understands that Jesus died for them, was buried, rose again, and paid for our sins. And that day, through the conviction of God upon our lives, the day we turn to Christ and receive him as Savior, then the Bible says we can be born again, all right? So I wanted to make sure you understand this. The judgment seat of Christ is not a decision place as far as for eternity, but it is for the Christians a reward place or a place to suffer the lack or loss of rewards, okay? I want to take the Bible this morning. I want to talk about the subject of treasures in heaven, okay? I want to answer you three questions about the rewards and treasures that can be received when we get to heaven. Here's the three questions. Preacher, what are treasures in heaven? Now watch this. Here's a good question. Why choose treasures in heaven over treasures on earth. I mean, come on, preacher. Why not just spend my entire life just going after everything that's here and trying to collect and get as much stuff as I can? And just, I mean, why not just go after? That's what the human race seems to be interested. Why choose treasures in heaven over treasures in earth? And finally, how does God view those who serve mammon instead of serving him? I'm going to get into the message this morning. Treasures in heaven. Number one, what are treasures in heaven? What are treasures in heaven? We read in our text verse, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves, here it is, treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven are any investment that you make that makes a positive impact on eternity. Any investment that you make here on earth that makes a positive impact on eternity. See, treasures in heaven has to do with eternity, while treasures on earth just has to do with what we are living and doing now. Uh, treasures on earth is any investment made that only matters here on earth. So every single time you invest in something that's going to be eternal, then those treasures go to heaven. Anytime you invest in something that is only temporal and that will one day pass away, that you are investing in treasures on earth. Now I want to take you back because it's interesting that this portion of scripture right here where God tells us, Jesus tells us, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, and he encourages us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, this portion of scripture is found in the Sermon on the Mount. Go, well, if you will, to chapter 6, the beginning of the same chapter, verse number 1. I won't teach down through all of this, but folks, there's three examples. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm wrapping my brain around this, all right? There's three examples that are given before Jesus then gives the admonition for us not to lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth and to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. The first example has to do with giving. In chapter 6, verse 1, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Very interesting. So he first starts out by talking about alms. And he said, if you give, 
if you sacrificially give, you sacrificially uh, invest in people and in eternity, if you, if you sacrificially give to the cause of Christ and you do it just to be seen of men, then he said, you got your reward when the, you got noticed. So he said, don't do it that way. See, this word secret is going to pop up in our scriptures, folks. Verse 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. Now, folks, he's not talking down the idea of giving. Giving is a good thing. One of the things that we're going to be rewarded for in heaven is our sacrificial giving. But can you imagine a few minutes ago while we were having our ushers come forward and they were walking down the aisles and they were passing the uh, plates. Can you imagine if uh, when the plate got to Brother Levi's room and uh, it was getting, and, and he, and it, it, it passed down to him and he had his offering. If all of a sudden he stood up and he hired two men with trumpets to stand up on either side of him and both of these men blew the trumpets and as they blew the trumpets, Brother Levi takes the plate and turns around and looks at everybody. And that's this number. And they're playing the trumpet so that everybody sees and everybody pays attention. I know that preacher, that's ludicrous. That's what was going on in Jesus' day. There's some ludicrous things happening in today's society too, okay? What he's saying is this. He's saying, you know what? Listen, if you're going to lay up treasures in heaven, then be concerned about what God thinks about it. And be reminded that it is enough for God to see it. Whether or not anybody else notices it. Whether or not anybody else uh, uh, will ever know on this earth. Whether it goes to your grave as a secret between you and God. God saw it. God knows it. And God's going to reward you for it one of these days. He goes on in verse number 5 to talk about secret prayer. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. That they may that, listen, folks. We're talking about motive here. Is there a wrong to? Is it wrong to to pray in a synagogue? Is it wrong to pray at church? I had one of the men lead in prayer a minute ago. Is it wrong to stand on a street corner and pray? No, I think we probably need somebody standing on every street corner of America and saying pray at prayers right now. It's not talking about the action. It wasn't talking about the giving. It wasn't talking about the praying. It was talking about the motive. Why were they out there on the street corner? Why were they standing up in the synagogue? Because their goal was not getting their prayers to God. Their goal was trying to impress people around them. Now listen, a good Christian, I'm going to help some of you. A good Christian is one who's just interested in serving the Lord. And you know what? Whether anybody notices or don't notice if they happen to be there or don't happen to be there, if somebody happens to see it or not, ha not sees it at all, it really never enters the thinking of a Christian that's going to be rewarded in heaven because you see that's not why they're doing it. They're praying because they need to bring petitions to God. They're giving because there's needs and there's opportunity to be a help to people around them. Then in verse number 16, it, it tackles the subject of fasting. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Can you imagine such a thing? I always wondered, how do you disfigure your face? I, I, I'm not sure what that, you know, I, I thought I could see them maybe before they go out. They got a mirror of reflecting glass, and they're, they're trying to practice all of the poor pitiful me, you know, facial expressions. So that make sure that when I walk out, I just look like I'm hurting and I'm in agony and I'm in pain. And that way everybody will come up and go, oh, what's going on? Oh, well, I really shouldn't talk about it. But since you asked, I'm fasting. And God says, well, good for you. You just got your reward for it too. Okay, now again, is it talking? Is it the Bible talk? No, I could take you on a whole Bible study and show you where fasting is a wonderful, positive, biblical practice. But you know what God's saying is God's saying, listen, if you're not careful, folks, and this could be a preacher preaching on a Sunday morning or somebody else doing something on Monday, Tuesday. Uh, listen, you know what? Our motive for everything we ought to do is to do it for the glory of God, to do it for God's glory, understanding that he sees it and he'll reward us. And you know what, folks? It's going to help some of you to get over this whole idea of being concerned about what everybody around you thinks. Sure. And my goodness sakes, if somebody didn't come and 
up to you and applaud or you haven't got patted on the head lately or somebody hadn't mentioned you publicly about something, you don't care. It doesn't matter to you because you're not doing it for that. You're doing it for God. And, and that's what it's talking about. Now, God's going through and teaching these three things and then he's going to go right into this idea of laying up treasures on earth or laying up treasures in heaven. And he said this, he said, listen, rewards, they, listen, you, they'll be lost if you fail to invest in these three areas. Listen, he's he's saying there are get, there is a type of giving that I will reward in heaven. And there's a type of praying that I'll reward in heaven. And there's a type of fasting that I'll reward in heaven. But he said, listen to me, and, it, and if you don't give and you don't pray and you don't fast, then you know what? You're not going to get rewarded in heaven. So it's it's not talking down those things. He's saying this, no reward will be given to those who refuse to sacrificially give. Well, I never give, but at least I'm not a hypocrite about it. You know, well, that's not going to help you at the judgment seat. Okay, well, Lord, I know I never gave, but I wasn't a hypocrite about it. Well, you know, God says you can give and not be a hypocrite about it. Okay, so it's not talking about these. You know, I never prayed and I never fasted, but at least I wasn't a hypocrite about it. No, why don't you just do it and not be a hypocrite about it, all right? So no reward will be given to those who refuse to secretly pray. No reward's going to be given to those who refuse to suffer in body or sacrifice in time for the kingdom of God. However, I want to also warn us, all of us that are busy for the Lord. However, you can also faithfully give and faithfully pray and faithfully fast and still have no reward when you get to heaven. See, God not only judges our actions, he judges our motives. Notice that God the Father, he puts a premium on this idea of secrecy. When you read every one of these, the Bible says, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Boy, this is a good thing to learn. Young man, young lady, listen to me. Don't always need to be bragged on. When you do the right thing, don't turn around and expect everybody to be standing there clapping for you. Do the right thing and then look to God and say, are you happy, Lord? Are you happy with that? And if he's happy, that needs to be good enough. That needs to be good enough. See, our fa Heavenly Father sees in secret and he rewards those who are willing to serve him without blowing a trumpet or without standing out on a street corner or without trying to press men with our sacrifices and suffering. Now, preacher, what are treasures in heaven? They are the humble and sincere acts of Christian giving, Christian piety, and Christian sacrifice that is done not to draw attention to ourselves, but are done for one re reason and one reason only, and that's to help others and bring glory to God. Now, folks, get a hold of that right there, and you know what? The judgment day for you is going to be a good day, a happy day. So what are treasures in heaven? Uh, they are the humble and sincere acts of Christian giving, Christian piety, Christian sacrifice, and suffering that is done not to draw attention to ourselves, but to be done to bring glory to God. Number two, why choose treasures in heaven over treasures on, on earth? Now, come on, look, uh, preacher, look around. I mean, good night. If you see the way the average American lives, they're not interested in what's going to happen after death. They're all into what's going to happen right now. They're, they're not interested in what they're going to get or not get after death. They want to know what they're going to get today. I mean, why not join the rest of the crowd? Why not just sell out with this idea that, you know, in the 1980s, when I was, uh, you know, uh, in, in my uh, early 20s, I, I call it the decade of greed when the bumper sticker came out. People actually had this on their vehicle he who dies with the most toys wins. And, and that's the mentality of Christians, even Christian Americans sometimes, if we're not careful. We've got to be so guarded against this because too many people are judging each other and evaluating each other on how big a house they live in or how fancy of a car they drive. And young people, listen, I want to try to help you. I don't care if somebody else has got a $500 pair of designer jeans, and you've got a J.C. Penny, you know, I was starting to say Kmart Blue Light Special, but I don't even know if anybody knows what Kmart Blue Light Special is anymore. But uh, or, or a Goodwill, I, hey, listen, a, a piece of clothing, or the name on a piece of clothing. Somehow we've got our befuddled minds thinking that makes us better, more important than somebody else. Years ago, I. I was bi bivocational. I pastored my first church, and I, I 
uh, drove a public school bus. And, uh, you know, that's what I did to help supplement the income. The church couldn't pay me, but just a, you know, a small amount. So I, I hustled on the side. And, and I, one of the things I did was I drove a public school bus. I started out by being a substitute bus driver. And so that was always interesting. You know, anybody ever driven a public school bus in here? Public school bus. You, did you drive a public school? They let you drive a public school bus in Montana, in the mountains. Oh, my goodness sakes. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, and, and so if you're a substitute driver, it's kind of like being a substitute teacher, okay? You know, you're at the mercy of everything. So they said, well, so-and-so can't drive this afternoon, so her bus number is this number, and you need to pick it up and pull over in this slot. And there'll be a third grade girl that knows all the route stops, you know. Now, this is going to go well. This is going to go really, really well, you know. So, but, uh, you know, and one of the fun things we always had was uh, she'd say, you know, a little third grade girl. And she'd say, now, turn right up here. And I said, okay. So I'd get to the next intersection, turn right. No, that way. I said, you, you said turn right. Up here. No, I meant right up here. I, so I finally just started saying, you're going to say two words, okay. You're going to say door, or you're going to say window. Because on a bus, you got a door over here, and you got a window over here. No left, right. No, the other left. The other right. Oh, I, I went around the block so many times as a substitute. One, one uh, morning, I've never been on this route. Just called in the service, and the first little kid I picked up supposedly knew the whole rest of the route. And thank goodness he did. And, and he's saying, now turn up here and go. And, 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 you know, it went pretty, you know, such mornings of a public school bus driver, you don't really earn your money on mornings because they're all tired and they're all exhausted and they all, for the most part, and 90% of the trip, they're half asleep, you know. So that last 10 minutes or so, they start getting going. But, you know, it's pretty quiet in the morning time. This boy's directing me from this to this to this. And, and all of a sudden, we got going down to one of the last few stops. And I noticed there was a stirring in the bus and some guys poking and laughing and, pointing out the window. And the next stop that I stopped at was a really, really dilapidated, run-down, not well-kept home. And I pulled up in front and I opened the door and here comes this boy out. And, and folks, listen to me, you know what? My daddy grew up wearing hand-me-downs. When you're the last of nine kids, you know all about hand-me-downs, okay? My dad was born 1939, coming out of the Depression era, and they didn't throw anything away. And But here comes this little boy out and he, gets on the bus and as soon as he does I mean you can tell this is the kid everybody picks on now, I want you young people listen to me because I'm trying to get something across to you this is important okay this is a kid that everybody picks on this is the kid that everybody makes fun of this is the poor kid he don't have the nice clothes okay so what he don't live in a fancy house so what no he don't he don't have a lunch so what and I began to notice as soon as he came on, it was almost like entertainment time for the rest of the bus. And as he'd walk by, people would scoot over and he'd try to sit down. They'd scoot over and wouldn't let him sit down. And, and uh, you know, boys were making fun of him. Girls were laughing at him and all this stuff. And I finally hollered back, hey, somebody make a, a room for him. So some kid jumped out of his seat and went and got another seat. So he had to sit by him and he sat there and sat down by himself. Kid looked miserable. Kid, look, look right up here, folks. No human being ought ever be treated that way. If somehow that makes you feel better about yourself, then something's broken inside of you. You got to run down people, put down people in order to listen. This whole thing about because I live in this part of town and you live in this part of town, I'm worth more, I'm more important. That's not true. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for that little boy as much as he died for anybody else on that bus. And if that little boy had been the only one that lived on earth, you know what? Jesus Christ would have still come down and died for that one little boy. That's how much that little boy means to him. And so, you know what I did? I didn't say a word. I unloaded them. They got on the bus. I took them home. And the next morning, I had to drive for this same route again. And I picked the whole route up. We got down to the road where we were going to make this last pickup, the last little boy, and I pulled the bus over the side. Now, they say if you're a preacher that you're not allowed to preach a sermon on a public school bus. But I'm telling you, they got a sermon that morning. And I stood up in front of that bus and I said, now I want everybody in here to look up here. And I, I, I wrote, read them the riot act. I just flat told them, I don't know. I, what I watched this morning, I will never stand by a watch again in my life. I said, there's a little boy getting ready to come up here that we're about to pick up. And he's getting ready to get on this bus. 
And you know what? He don't live as nice a house as some of you do. And maybe he don't have as nice a clothes. By the way, some of you, instead of making fun of him for not having a lunch, maybe I'll try sharing your lunch with somebody like this. But I'm going to tell you something. I just told him, I lost so much respect for some of you yesterday. If you grow up thinking that you have a right to treat somebody, you will not do it while Jerry Ross is the bus driver. Do I make myself clear? And buddy, they were standing up straight. They're sitting up straight and tall, and they were nodding like that. Kid got on the bus, and everybody was begging for him to sit with them and, and you know, say hi and good morning and all of this stuff. And, and, and you know what? We had a little revival on the public school bus. Now, that's what, that's what this is all about. But listen to me. If you go ahead, come on, it's not just kids. I wish that was only children that treated each other that way. But if you want to live your life thinking that because you drive a certain vehicle, live in a certain neighborhood, or wear a certain type of clothes, or your last name spelled a certain way, that you're so much more important than everybody else in the human race, God pity your wicked soul. Because you know what? You're a sinner just like all the rest of us are sinners. And if you got what you deserved, you'd get what I deserved, and that's go to a devil's hell. If it wasn't for the grace of God, none of us, none of us would go to heaven. And you know what we ought to do is stop getting caught up by a, in a materialistic society that's always worried about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And you know what? You've made a, we've made heroes out of celebrities and millionaires and multimillionaires and, 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 and you know, we're hooked on American Idol and, hey, let's break through. And if I could just make this money and I can't pay for my gas at the station because... I'm standing in line watching people buy lottery tickets. You know why? Greed, greed, covetousness. It, where's contentment, folks? This life is short. Okay, I clocked in my 59th year last August. I can't tell you how old my wife is, all right? I can't tell you that because a man shouldn't tell how old his wife is. But her birthday was yesterday. And uh, she's going to be 60 next year. And so... Uh, but I'm not going to tell you how old she is because that'd be the wrong thing to do. But, uh, but uh, hey, hey, you know what you figure out? This thing goes quick. I know some of you young men. I'm going to tell you what, some of you young ladies, you know, I mean, it seems like, to, to you know, when you're in your childhood years and your teenage years, every year seems like five years. And you, and when's the next birthday coming? And so, But I'm telling you, come on, 20-somethings. You get into those 20s and next thing you blink a few times and you're on the 30. 30-ish end of the 20s. Come on. And how did I get here so quick? And I'm going around talking to teenagers that I used to have in my youth group here that are having kids that are getting ready to come in the teen department. What are you saying? I'm saying, hey, if this is all there is, no wonder people are jumping off bridges. Okay, you're going to spend your whole life chasing whatever the world has. You're going to get to the end of your life. Come on, folks. You've heard your preacher say this is good for us. But if you want a reality check, you need to you need to go to some estate auctions. No, no, just look them up in the newspaper. Just Google where the next one is. I'm not telling you to go there and buy anything. You just need to go there and watch. Because you know what? Some couple started out when they were in their late teens, early 20s, and they got hitched, and they, they worked their whole lives, and they gathered up what they gathered, and they have their things. And, and you know what? They spent a whole lifetime getting stuff. And you know what? An auctioneer will walk in there and a whole crew will pull all of that out into the front yard in a couple, three hours. Everything they worked a lifetime is going off on some trailer or in somebody's trunk or somebody's back seat. What I'm saying is, folks, listen to me. God's saying this. Jesus, red letter words. He's looking at the human race. He's down here for just a short time. He's taking a little group of disciples and said, listen, I'm going to try to teach you a different way to live. It's not going to make sense to most people, but you need to listen to what I'm going to say. Don't spend your life laying up treasures down here. You know why? Because they can be corrupted. That's what the Bible says. They can be stolen. What you need to do is live your life in such a way that you impact what's going to be on the other side in eternity. Folks, people are more important than possessions. Possessions are temporal. People are eternal. Invest in people's lives. Invest in each other. Invest in your children. Raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't worry about the stuff. Okay? I hope that helps you. Amen. All right. What are, the, what are the treasures? And now we ask, why choose treasures in heaven over treasures in earth? Well, treasures in heaven are eternal. Treasures on earth are temporal. Treasures in heaven are secure. Treasures on earth can be corrupted or stolen. 
treasures in heaven. Direct your hearts upward. Where your treasure is, there your heart be also. See, every time I invest in people and I invest in eternity, I do something for the cause of Christ, the kingdom of God. Those are all eternal things. And the more I invest in those, wherever my treasure is, the Bible says your heart's going to follow. Come on, I've been in airports before and I've watched well-dressed businessmen get the Wall Street Journal. And you know what? I just see them pouring over the pages that tell all about the stocks and bonds and all of that. And they don't so much do that anymore because they're all doing it on their phone now. But I, I can tell you that. And, and you know what? I never have bought a Wall Street Journal and checked any of that. Do you know why their heart is in that and mine's not? And I'm not saying it's wrong to have some. I'm just saying it's because that's where their treasure is. But you know what? When I come here on Sunday morning, I look around. I'm checking my investments. Come on now, bus captains, you know what you're doing? You're going around picking up your investments. Think about this. I mentioned that the other night. I mean, we run five buses uh, uh, every Sunday morning. We have five routes. I actually run six buses. And, uh, you know, to get everybody. I mean, rural America, we're so spread out. you got to drive a lot of... A lot of you realize just how much fuel goes in those buses every single week in preacher. Man, we can have so much nicer this and so much nicer that. And it wouldn't have taken us so long. We could have the whole parking lot paved and we could have this and we could have that. And and what what it listen, folks, listen to me. You know what? This building right here, we're just using temporarily. Okay, this isn't the church. The people are the church. You know what? One of these things, that we, one of these days, if you read the Bible and you read the end times, all this is going to burn up with a fervent heat. That means every single possession me and you have, folks, listen to me. I've never seen a hearse going down the road pulling a U-Haul trailer. You know why? You can't take it with you. And so, you know, I, hey, God allows us to have some things. And, and I understand the biblical principle. The Bible says if you don't provide your, for your own, you're worse than an infidel. It's right to go to work. It's right to pay your bills. It's right to put a roof over your head. It's right to provide for your family. That's all right. But all of a sudden, listen, one man said it this way. It's not wrong to have things. It only becomes wrong when things have you. And, and we all got to look at where that line is in our life. God says, listen, I understand you got to go to work. And I got to understand you've got to make a living. I understand you got to provide for your family. But don't spend your whole life investing in things that are just going to burn up one of these days. People are eternal. That's why we spend the money we do at Blessed Oak Baptist Church in this effort to get the gospel out in all the different ministries and ways we do it. Because, listen, folks, if we can get the gospel out and people can hear the gospel and people can get saved, then that person, their entire eternal destination is changed. And, and they're going to be in heaven one of these days. And so that's why we, we invest uh, where we invest, what we do, what we do. Why choose heavens or treasures in heaven over treasures on earth? The last one. Preacher, how does God view those who serve mammon instead of serving him? I'm going to take you to one illustration. Over to Luke chapter number 12. If you'll flip over there, I'm going to read a short parable to you that I think will say a lot to us and teach us a lot. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus gives a parable. Now, a parable is just a story, kind of a made-up story, imaginary story that, that, that teaches an eternal lesson, a spiritual lesson. Luke chapter 12, if you're there, there, if you look in verse number 13, Luke chapter 12 and verse number 13. All right, very good. One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Folks, if you want a statement that summarizes the whole message, just circle what I just read there at the end of that. Red letter words, let's hear Jesus. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possess of. Verse number 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. plentifully. And he thought within himself, this rich man did, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He said, This will I do. 
I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds like the American dream. Honestly, it sounds like what everybody in America is trying to accomplish. I'm going to work hard all of my life so that I can stockpile all this stuff so as soon as possible I can retire, and then I'll be able to enjoy the last 10 or 15 or 20 years of my life, which you won't really enjoy that much because there's something called old age and your body breaks down. Good luck with that theory, okay? All right, but that's we bought into it, okay? And, he, and that's it. And God said unto him, wow. That seems a little harsh. These are red-letter words. Jesus speaks truth. But God said unto him, Thou fool. So he's saying, anybody that follows that plan right there, you're being a fool. That's right. Now he's going to explain why. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? It's going to be whoever buys it at the estate sale I was talking about. Now here it is, verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. And again, I like the balance there. God, he doesn't say it's wrong to have things. He doesn't say it was wrong for him to have a farm. It wasn't wrong for him to put out a crop. It wasn't far, wrong for him to harvest the crop. It wasn't even wrong for him to be blessed with an ab abundance of crop. What was wrong again was his attitude. Because God blessed him in an unusual way with an abundance and folks, what we, our mindset as American Christians towards abundance is going to tell more about us than almost anything else. Okay, folks, God's going to provide our needs. And it's nothing wrong with working, providing your needs. But when God surprises you or blesses you with an abundance, what are you going to do with that abundance? What attitude do you have towards it? You know what his attitude was? What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my gifts. This is mine. This is mine. Well, if God give, had given you the health, it, you wouldn't have it. If God didn't give you the land, you wouldn't be able to put the crop in. You know what? God didn't give you the resources and finances for the seed. Folks, listen to me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. One of the things important is understanding the difference between ownership and stewardship. See, the world has things, and they say, well, they're mine. The Christian does not view things as ours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the earth belongs to God and everything in it belongs to God. And he allows us to be stewards over some of his stuff from time to time. And he gives us an abundance of some of his stuff from time to time. And what we're supposed to do as stewards is to look to the Lord and say, this is an unexpected blessing, unexpected abundance. What would you like me to do with your stuff? You know what God might say? He might say, your barn's too small. Tear it down and build a bigger barn. It wasn't even the tearing down of the barn and building the bigger one that was the problem. It was the attitude. This is mine. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to pray and ask God what to do with it. I'm just going to. I'm going to tear all my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And then I'm going to stockpile everything. And I'm going to get to the point where I won't have to plant. And I won't have to harvest. I'll just be able to live off what I've got. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. I'm going to spend my life partying and enjoying life. And God looks down the creator of the universe and said, I did not put you on earth to live like that. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to shorten your life. Okay, because if that's all you think life is, then I'm going to see to it that you don't get to live out what you thought you'd get to live out. Now, folks, listen to me. Come on. I want the Lord blessing me, and I want the Lord working with me, not against me. And a lot of it's going to have to do with my attitude. You know, and again, so many of these things that are in these stories are not wrong things in and of themselves. It's the attitude they had towards it. And I say this from time to time, but I think every good Christian ought to walk around their house. They ought to just stand up in front of their house and say, Lord, this is your house. They ought to walk over and touch the vehicles and say, they're, they're yours, Lord. That's yours. That's yours. I've seen a few vehicles that hear God make say, no, I don't want that one. You know, but say, that's yours. That's yours. Come on, guys. And go in our shops where we really don't want, you know, that's our, where we put our stuff. And walk around and say, this is yours, Lord. This is yours. This is yours. Thank you for letting me enjoy it. And I'll enjoy it as long as you want me to enjoy it. And if the day comes, I need to sell it and, and you want the money somewhere else. Hey, all of a sudden, unexpected financial blessing comes in. 
what we didn't expect that. And God, wow. And I think right then, right then, God says, okay, let me see if I can trust them. Let me see if they've learned it yet, if they get it yet. Are you gonna even going to ask why I blessed you? See, a lot of times God is trying to meet a need here. And so there's a need in this person's life. And this person's playing, praying that God would meet the need in his life. But if God then sees to it that he's blessed directly, he robs us of an opportunity of being a part of the process, of being a blessing. Listen, there's the difference between receiving a blessing and being a blessing. And sometimes, folks, we're the ones that are in need of the receiving of a blessing. And God does that for us. But there's also times where God gives us an abundance, and if we bowed our head and prayed, it wouldn't take us probably 30 seconds for the Lord to say, well, I did bless you a little extra this month, but that's really not for you. I blessed you because you remember that family at the church that's going through the tough time and he just got laid off. And you know what? Remember when there were times in your life where I sent a little extra your way? It's time for you to pay that back. So I blessed you. Now, right now, I'm telling you, I'm telling you in the economy of God, see, we, we look at how, how the world views finances and the world views possessions and the world views, and then we get to the Bible and it opens up our eyes to a whole different dimension. And see, folks, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, come on, his resources are endless. The streets in heaven are paved with gold. Okay, he can pull this string. He can turn on this faucet. He can turn off this faucet. So what we do is we just are thankful, first of all, in everything that God gives us. We treat it as, as, as if it's his, not ours, because it is. When we, are, when we are blessed with an unexpected blessing, we look around to find out, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And sometimes, come on, man, sometimes God says, you married an awfully good wife and it's been a while since you spoiled her. Why don't you just take a little of that and spoil that woman? That's why I gave you that. Hey, you got a child there, and you know what? You've been praying over this need, and he has this need, or she has this need. Be an encouragement to him. But I'm telling you, folks, God does. it is not God if every single time you pray that prayer, it goes back into you and yours. That is not how God operates, even most of the time. Most of the time, God's just saying, well, here's the deal. I want to see if I can trust you. I want to see if I can give you an abundance and a blessing. And if you're humble enough to realize it's really not yours and it came from me, and I want to just see if I can bless you some more by seeing if you'll be obedient to my leading of the leading of my spirit to get it where I want it to get to. Now, not only have, have I blessed that person that had the need, but I've blessed you by allowing you to be a blessing. And folks, listen to me. The more you get into that kind of a life, the more you realize this is the best way in the world to live. Okay, because God will, listen, God, God will continue to bless those that are willing to be a conduit. Okay, I mean, if you're willing to be a river instead of a, a dammed up lake, okay, if everything that comes in, you just hold, pretty soon God's going to say, well, that's enough of that. But if somebody's willing to be that river, that stream, and, and God takes care, man, there's so much in this, but God takes care of the stewards. The steward was always taken care of. God will bless the person that will treat the things this way. And so, you know, God's going to take care of you. But, but notice in this man, notice what was done here. God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then shalt thou provide uh, those things, then and then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure in heaven. So what did we learn from this? What was this man's failures? Why did God call him thou fool? He failed to recognize where the blessings came from and who they ultimately belonged to. He failed to recognize or consider the purpose of the extra blessing. He failed to recognize that God is in control of what you will have and how long you'll have it. And by the way, even in control of how long you'll live. Here's the little Bible phrase. He failed to be rich towards God. Now, folks, listen to me, and I'll end right there. But I hope, I hope 
that when I stand at the judgment seat on these days, God's going to be able to say, this man was rich towards me. I don't care if he could, he wasn't rich in the eyes of the world. Nobody in the community looked and pointed and said, boy, there's a rich man. But he was rich towards me. Because you know what? He was the man that I could trust. That was the family I could trust to bless with an abundance. And they would have a tender enough heart to make sure that it got to the right place. Hey, folks, I'm not trying to be that the Holy Spirit in your life. And don't try to be the Holy Spirit in my life. But I'm telling you, each and every one of us have the Holy Spirit. And if we'll ask him, he's real good at guiding and putting things exactly where they need to be. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this idea of treasures in heaven. Lord, I believe that there's going to be rewards. Rewards in heaven based on good stewardship. Rewards in heaven by being used of God to be able to get money to the missionaries that need it. Money to the bus ministry to put the fuel in the, in the tanks. Money directed to the different outreach ministries. Money given so that tracts can be printed and the gospel can be proclaimed and equipment can be purchased for our website and our radio ministry and all the different things. But Lord, it's not just the church. So many times you'll speak to a, a person's heart about a need that they would be the only one that would know about. Maybe that next door neighbor. Maybe that person that you've brought in their life. Maybe that coworker. Maybe that family member. Lord, we just want to be faithful. Help us to be very, very faithful in this matter of laying up treasures in heaven. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'll help us. Help us to think like you thought. Jesus, I'm reading this story, and I, I'm just imagining as you're trying to teach the disciples a whole new way of looking at the world. Lord, I think 11 of them got it. We found out later on that 12th disciple, Judas, was willing to sell out the Lord Jesus Christ for just a bag full of silver. And so, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't sell you out today. Help us to live for you. Help us to live content. Help us to lay up treasures in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.